Hello, everyone. Welcome to the number one podcast in the world. We got the Footballer Life Pod here with myself, Cal Mati, Coach Lucas in the top left. And we have the father, the godfather, the grandfather, the founder of the Footballer Life Program and the Footballer Life Pod. This is an internal pod. We have the main man, David Clark. David Clark, how are you today? Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. First of all, I want to say thank you for being our host in this uh, in this podcast, and then also the YouTube channel helping us out with that too. It's huge. We're super excited to have you guys. So, absolutely, I love the Chicago hat too. By the way, thank you, sir. I figured it matches with the footballer life blue, baby. You see, we're all branded up. We're all branded up. I know. I got branded. There love we go. It, man. I, I'm excited. I could tell you guys, I'm, I'm excited to be part of this project and I'm, I'm really interested, David, to hear from you, like when this vision came about, like, can you describe what your vision is for footballer life? So yeah, this has been about four or five years in the making, really. Um, you know, we, we want to create a uh, platform globally, a community that's supportive uh, to to those in the game, not just players, uh, not just parents or or trainers or whoever it is that's in the game, supporters of a certain team. We want to create a supportive environment. Uh, and so we don't really feel that there's anything out there right now that is a good community for support in terms of uh, all the stakeholders in the football uh, community itself. Um, and so that's the main uh, goal in this. And also it's just, it's a fragmented marketplace. And so you got to go a lot of different places to find news or find, uh, you know, you're going to Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, you're going to all these different social media platforms. None of them are focused on football, you know? And mm -hmm. so it's like, you're, you're, tr you're going around looking for news. You're looking for, you know, you're going to some sort of app for your kid's team. Uh, you know, it's all so fragmented. And so we want to bring everyone together. Uh, you know, we're kind of like a train station, we like to say. So it's like we want to bring people on. You can still go to your Instagram, go to your different uh, engagement platforms, but we want to have everyone in one place. I think that's probably, you know, a good uh, summary of what we're trying to do. Beautiful, beautiful. For those of you who stick along with this episode, you're going to be able to find out all about the vision for the footballer life, or in other words, the house for football, the home for football, right. as David is looking to create now. Before we dive into footballer life, I want to dive into David Clark. So I'd like to take us all the way back, David, from before you were a father, before you were an adult. Where did you start with football? Tell us about your life story ever since you were a kid. So I was in that uh, um, group of, of kids that parents would coach, but they had never seen soccer before. You know, like they were just out there, you know, trying to help the best they could. There was not really many coaches at that time in the 80s that, you know, that actually had experience, you know, in the game, you know. And so I was uh, I started uh, probably five years old playing, but I was also playing, of course, basketball and running track or whatever else I was doing. And so um, I I started young and uh, and really found passion in in soccer itself. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really follow it much because there wasn't really much to follow in the U.S., but I played uh, and uh, and enjoyed the game and ended up playing through college, uh, you know, and stopping after that. But uh, I played at James Madison University uh, in, in college for four years and had a, an amazing time playing with a lot of great, great players. So Beautiful, beautiful. Tell us a little bit more about your experience trying to make it to the collegiate level and what that was like for you, as well as your experience throughout your college career. Yeah, so in those days, uh, everything was run through the ODP program. Now it's uh, not so much, you know, now you have the, all these different, you know, ECNL and all these different uh, academy systems and everything. But back in those days, you had to go through the ODP system to get uh, any kind of exposure, right, in the game. And so I played on a club team uh, that was very strong with a lot of uh, Division One players coming through that system, a lot of national team players in our club system. And so, uh, you know, we got some exposure that way, and I made it into the ODP program. And then once you got high enough in the ODP program, it was pretty, uh, you know, you got the exposure you needed to get in front of these Division One coaches. And so that's what propelled me to get an offer, uh, you know, at James Madison, among a couple other places. But uh, that was where I wanted to go. That was only two hours from home, and uh, and it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. So beautiful, 
you know, before we dig into your experience throughout your college career, I'm actually curious. I myself didn't have the luxury of playing in college due to an injury I suffered in high school. But Coach Lucas, you were recruited to play in college as well. So you hear Dave talk about kind of the recruitment process and what that looked like in the 80s and how it almost became a lot more complicated over time. Now, you weren't recruited or playing in college in the 80s. So how did that compare your path to trying to get recruited to play in college? How did that compare to David speaking about his path? That that's a good question. When he was saying that in my head, I'm like, dang, I should have played more ODP. I should have <laughs> got into that. I should have broke into that. But um, and David, you could tell me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like when I started coming up, which was like uh, 2000s, that like showcases and ID camps right. and like all these other stuff started to really emerge and really caused the landscape of exposure to just it kind of explode in a way. It started becoming more, all the, there, there became more options for players for, for exposure. So for me, it was about showcases, tournaments, ID camps, those types of things. Right. Yeah. You know, the thing is that there was a funnel that just went one place, which is ODP, you know, people could still come and and they would obviously recruit, you know, tournaments and things like that. But the ODP system was where they tried to funnel the best kids into and so you'd go in and try to make the state team and then you'd make the regional team. And then once you made the regional team, then you would try out together for the national team. And so by the time you got to that regional level, you know, you didn't really have to go looking for colleges. You know, they they would just go look on those lists and say, OK, let's let's find this kid. You know, he's in our area. Let's recruit this kid, you know. And so it was a lot easier now. I think it's much more difficult, much more fragmented in terms of, uh, you know, much more action act. I guess, access to the coaches themselves. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you can just email coaches or whatever. Back then we didn't, we weren't really emailing coaches or anything. You know, our parents, you know, we, we didn't reach out to them and maybe, a, you know, this was, I, I'm an old guy, you know? So this is like, I went, I'm 92 to 96. So I was getting recruited late eighties and early nineties, you know, early nineties really. But, but uh, anyway, just a different system now. I don't know if it's better or worse, but it just, it was, it was one way to the top. You know, and so it's like that it seems like, you know, the U.S. is pretty fragmented in, in that sense now. Yeah, it's crazy to hear about that. Just the system changing in itself, like as Coach Lucas says, it kind of exploded in terms of the different routes that you can take to get recruited. Right. And here, that word exploded almost makes it sound like it was a good thing. And you're right, <laughs> David, I don't think any of us can say that the system changed for better or for worse. Right. However, I can speak to my experience just talking with parents over the past four years. I mean, I've spoke with thousands of soccer parents and now college recruitment is still probably at the top of the list of unknowns where they don't right. know the right path. They don't know which direction they should be going. So it almost makes it seem like it was a lot simpler when it was just that one path versus 15 different routes you can take, none of them being identified as greater than the other. So I think it's a pro and a con because on one end, there's more that a player can do if for whatever reason they weren't able to break into that ODP type setting. Right. And on the other end, there's almost too much to where you don't know which is the best path. But that's that's a really interesting take to hear how the system has changed over the years. Um, but yeah, that's super cool. So what was it like for you in college, Dave? Tell us about your collegiate career. I know you said it was amazing, but give us a little bit more insight on that. So college was great. I mean, we I went to James Madison. We were, you know, top 10 Division One school during that period uh, and had a very successful run. A lot of great players. We had uh, you know, a lot of people that came out of that team. Uh, Carlo is now the uh, head of the Premier League in Finland. Uh, he's a chairman. <laughs> Uh, you know, and uh, the uh, another guy I played with, Jake Edwards, is the president of the USL. Uh, you know, we have guys out of that team that are college coaches and, you know, went on to play professionally and all that. So it was a great group of guys. Uh, and so that was the best part of just the guys, you know, and the, and the camaraderie and all that. Uh, but we also were facing up, up against uh, U, a UVA team that won four straight national championships and probably the greatest college team that was ever put together. Uh, and so that was with Bruce Arena coaching and uh, 
and they had Claudio Reyna and, you know, they, they were just stacked. I mean, from top to bottom, uh, <laughs> they were stacked by far the best team in the country. And, uh, and I would say, you know, these days, Claudio Reyna wouldn't touch a college soccer field if he was coming up now, right? Just like his son, Gio, right? He didn't go to college. And so uh, I think that uh, that you just can't match those teams because all the best players, I mean, were going through the college system and they happened to just snag them all. I mean, it was unbelievable, the team that they put together. I mean, it was, they were our rival, but I, I don't know about rival, if they looked at us as a rival because they were pretty much just demolishing everyone, but you know, uh, they were 40 minutes away, mm. you know, so it was pretty amazing to have like a team that's ranked, you know, we were, they were number one, we might've been fourth or fifth or something in the country. And we were 40 minutes away. And so oh, wow. I think uh, one game that we had in the uh, NCAA quarterfinals, I think that 7,000 people. And it was like the most pre-sale tickets at that time ever for a college soccer game. And it was crazy. I mean, the whole place was filled before the game started and it was nuts. That's incredible. The environment in those types of matches were probably insane. Oh, it was, you can't even imagine. <laughs> like when we got there on the bus, you know, there was just all people in the uh, tailgating. The whole place was tailgating. And so we went down under the stadium. Klockner Stadium was the Mecca. UVA's stadium was new. You know, they had spent millions of dollars on it. And that time, no one was doing that. And so um, they had locker rooms underneath the uh, the stands on the one side. And when we came out to warm up, the whole place was full. It was crazy. I mean, it was the loudest thing, you know, you could ever imagine. You know, for us, you know, as kids, you know, like we were just like, dang, this is intense. It was fun. <laughs> and we knew the other team, too. You know, the uh, UVA had a lot of guys from my club team. So we were all, you know, we knew everyone knew everyone on the field. Wow. You know, was, that it, it is so crazy. cool. Yeah, what, so. what's that sound i'd like to probe deeper on that angle which is like what what was some of the most rewarding experiences that you had during those times uh i would say um you know the fun part were traveling you know what i mean it sounds stupid but it's like just traveling be on a bus with your buddies you know there was no planes that we were flying around there wasn't a budget for that you know there was a little bit of that but mostly we were just on a bus going up and down virginia and Maryland and you know Pennsylvania or you know wherever you know we'd go down to Wake Forest and uh um and so uh you know just traveling with the guys we played my I think it was one of the first games not the first game of our uh my career we played Wake Forest uh and we were unranked uh at the time and I think they were ranked in the top five or something uh and so we went down there and we were warming up for the game uh on one of their practice fields i think we just had our shirts on we even said james madison on them right and we're playing wake forest the next day so we're warming up on the field just for you know before the game the next day and their assistant coach comes up and he's like what are you guys doing on this field you know we were just like uh we were like our coach was like what do you mean we're playing tomorrow and he was like who are you playing we're like we're playing wake forest we're playing you guys and he was just like oh okay well you, you know get off you only have a few minutes you know you got to get out the field you know, we were just like, seriously, you know, it was, it was funny. And so we beat them four zero the next day and, uh, and, uh, just thrashed them, you know, and they were just shocked. They had no idea who we were, you know, that we were any good. And so it, it was a, it was a fun moment, uh, beating up on those guys because they were obviously the, the blue bloods, you know, we were just the upstart. So after that, people knew who we were, you know, the next four years, we pretty much, uh, won most, most of it, you know. Uh, at least in our conference so that's incredible that's incredible it sounds like for you like growing up in odp and in the club scene and even going into college like although soccer may have not have been you know top in terms of like american sports or right. interest from americans it sounds like the culture at that time for you was really healthy and like like fun and um encouraging can you speak on like the culture growing up for you at that time yeah i think uh i was also a basketball player um and so pretty high level basketball player i don't know about college level but you know and so i i played in high school and club basketball and everything and so i think a lot of people when you played soccer back in those days uh, or football you know as we call it around the world but you know they were a little bit kind of like what do you why like they'd have to ask you like you know why are you going to play soccer you know what i mean like almost like it was a little bit strange like <laughs> And they didn't understand what that game was. Most people didn't understand it. But, yeah, it was a little bit of, 
you know, question marks, you know, in terms of why and, uh, um, and I loved it and I love basketball too, of course, but uh, I think the biggest thing in those days was people weren't sure of what the, you know, what the reward was at the end of the day. Like, why would you play the game, you know? Mm. Uh, and so it wasn't very supportive. I wouldn't say in that sense, you know, where, um, you know, I had times where I was, uh, went and tried out for, um, uh, you know, with the regional team, with the youth national team, and I'd have to miss a basketball game. And the coach were just like, why would you miss a basketball game? You know what I mean? And I was like, it's a pretty big deal. You know, I thought, you know, they had no idea and care. They were just like, you know, they didn't <laughs> care at all. You know, they were just like, you're missing a basketball game, you know? My gotcha. mom would have to say, but this is his path for college, you know, and this is where we're trying to go, you know. Mm. But I think that that was the thing. It, it just is nowadays, it's just you don't have to explain to everyone. I mean, the game is growing so quickly, you know. So 100%. That's beautiful. What position did you play? I played uh, when I was younger. I was playing attacking midfield, you know, in the middle mostly. In college, I played mostly on the wing left. I was a lefty, I was a left only player you know what i mean like i was like my right foot was you know for standing on it wasn't too great uh you know and so uh but anyway i was on the left side uh so uh, but uh yeah it was great it was a great memory i'll tell you college of college soccer even now today of course it's just it's a great opportunity it's it's just uh you can't really put words to how much fun it, it is even if you even if the soccer is not as uh, rewarding like say you don't have you know, a great career or you don't play as much as you want i mean it doesn't matter you're, you're still having so much fun you know mm. my left 100%. foot was just for standing on <laughs> my right foot. Said, i was lefty i was a lefty i'm sorry my right he foot said, yeah, he said my, my right foot footer. was just for standing on that's yeah, hilarious like, <laughs> yeah, I, I made fun of someone in the world cup the other day uh for because they only had one foot you know and one of my buddies texted me back he's like man you only have one foot i was like yeah but i'm not starting in the world cup <laughs> you know, it's like the whole different level there you know it's like that's so, so yeah, I, was, I was a lefty for sure that's so funny yeah cool well david i'd like to somewhat move into the next chapter of your life which is obviously post your collegiate career so what did things look like for you in terms of life after college, all the way into what you kind of pursued directly after college, how you started your family even? Tell us a little bit about that. I uh, went directly into the business world. Like I, I wasn't really interested in playing too much after uh, because I just knew there wasn't much money in it, even though it would be a lot of fun. You know, just at that point, I think I had a a good friend, his name was Brandon Pollard. I think he was the second pick in the MLS uh, draft, you know, back in maybe 95 or, you know, whatever it was, uh, or 94. And and he was hardly making anything, you know, and that's just, that's just the way it was, you know, in the MLS in those days, you know, it's like you, you weren't making much money. And so I saw that and I was like, I'm never going to get to that level, you know? So I was like, uh, you know, I'm not even going to make that, you know, even if I, you know, could do it, you know, so I moved out of soccer, went into the business world. Um, you know, we moved from Virginia to Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I ended up, you know, working there in the, in, uh, and got my MBA at Arizona State University. So we're Sun Devils. We, we were in Tempe for 21 years. And, and so, um, you know, and then I, I kind of was out of the soccer world for a long time, even though following it and had kids and all that. But uh, you know, now in the last four or five years, kind of getting back into it with this project. So, mm -hmm. And where did your family begin? When did you start your family and how did that, that come to be? Tempe, Arizona. So my wife is a JMU graduate too. So we moved, uh, she went to graduate school at the ASU as well, right out of uh, James Madison University. And then, uh, uh, and then she, um, you know, that we, after we moved there, I think it was a couple of years later, we ended up uh, getting engaged, uh, getting married back in Virginia. Uh, and then we lived in um, in Arizona for 21 years. And then we've been in uh, Colorado for almost six, Denver, Colorado. So we have a, 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 a 2004 boy who uh, is 18 and our daughter was an 06. You know, these are playing ages, obviously. Uh, you know, she was an 06, so she's 16. And uh, and so she uh, she's retiring from the game, uh, you know, right now, like at that age, a lot of kids, you know, kind of fall, not fall out of love with it, but it's just, it's not a path they're going to choose. And so, you know, it, it, the time you need doesn't really make a lot of sense, you know, so she, 
she kind of gave up the, the game. But uh, yeah, so we got two kids, and uh, we're a big soccer family for sure. We, we watch Beautiful. a lot of games on the weekend. A lot of games. So. Beautiful. Beautiful. So now you're in your post college life. You've started your family. You have a son. You have a daughter. Daughter, sorry. But where did the idea of footballer life come to be? When did you even consider that as a concept, and how? I I think it came from you know my son. My daughter was in the in the soccer, but not like my son. He was a little bit cr- uh, crazy in there. Like he was just hyper focused on it, you know. And and there wasn't really any uh, outlet for that. You know, it's like mm. there wasn't really much of a community out there. There wasn't, mm. um, you know, an outlet for kids that were really hungry to get better. Uh, things have gotten better recently, but, you know, back, you know, 13, 12, 13 years ago, you know, you had your club system, uh, you know, the club that you were involved in. But other than that, there wasn't a lot of engagement outside of that. And so um, so we originally were thinking about some sort of training app. Uh, and, and decided, you know, after discussion for a while on that, that we, we didn't really want to be a training app. We wanted to be an app that was, you know, or a community that was more uh, for everyone. You know what I mean? Like a, an app could come on there and build their business or a club could come on there or any kind of brand or, or a trainer or a player. You know, we want to bring everyone together. Um, and so that that's what it morphed into. And so um, a lot mm-hmm. of it came around you know, talking to people and seeing that there's like an economic and a geographic wall that's up in the football world, right? Mm-hmm. And obviously, U.S. is inside of that wall, which is great, you know, but there's a lot of kids out there that are outside that wall, you know, that uh, that economic wall. And so um, we don't want there to be an economic wall uh, for mm-hmm. these kids. You know, we want to make sure they get the same access. We want to bring down that, that barrier so that, uh, you know, if, if we do, there's mm-hmm. certain things that you have to, you know, with an app, you might have to charge money or whatever. We don't want to charge these kids money because we want to give them the same access that a kid in Chicago would have or a kid in London or a kid, you know, in wherever, Mexico City. I mean, there's some places that obviously some kids have access and some don't, but, you know, it's like we want to make sure that we're not boxing out any kids and making them feel like, man, I'd love to get on Football Life, but I don't have five bucks a month. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, or or whatever, you know, and so we want to steer clear of that. And so I think the best way for us to do that was to create a community so we could support these kids. I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant because I think, David, you've got such a big network, you know, you know a lot of people from all over the world, you know, high level people, whether it's coaches, directors, some of the folks that you mentioned earlier on the call. And I think it makes a lot of sense because you have a lot of resources that you can provide to these players that are behind that wall that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access. And I think that's just brilliant. Yeah. I think the biggest thing for us is uh, to give them hope that there's a process, you know, because right now there's no process, Mm. Uh, you know, and so with our player discovery, you know, feature that we're going to have inside the community, a player can just say, Hey, raise their hand and say, I want to be, I want to have my profile uh, in your database, like in your um, player discover, uh, area so that agents and scouts can find me and so what we'll do is we'll actually vet that profile make sure it's all you know has everything they need in there help them if they need to what like with whatever information they need to have in there uh and then we'll review that profile and once that profile is uh, accepted you know we think it's good enough for the agents and scouts to see them we will you know put them into that that database you know we'll uh, uh approve that profile you know, so mm-hmm. we also don't want people coming in and looking for players that uh, when a player is not active, right? You know, so that you, you have to raise your hand and ask, obviously, to get in that profile uh, database. And so we want to make it so that they can show, uh, you know, get exposure, show their uh, quality, um, uh, you know, in measurable ways. And then, you know, some some qualit- qualitative ways, too. Uh, so that uh, they can be seen. And then when they're seen, they'll know it. You know, if the agent looks at their profile, they'll, they'll get a little message that says, Hey, you know, uh, you know, agent in London looked at your profile. And that really gets these kids excited because they know, you know, it's a process, right? There's actually a process created versus just, you know, throwing something up on Instagram and hoping and praying someone sees it. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like, that's what they do. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Have you ever thought about doing like 
I don't know, like a footballer life showcase or a footballer life camp or something like that. Not that that's the immediate goal, but like right. eventually uh, tournaments, things of that right. nature. I can just picture like once you get some traction, get some players from everywhere that are really right. living and feeling the footballer life. Like I suspect you'll have some options at, at your fingertips of what you want to do and where you want to take this thing. Yeah, I mean, we we want to, you know, our goal is to get big enough so that we can help. Mm. You know, I always tell people that it's like as we grow, we'll have more resources, right? We'll bring on partners that will donate, you know, things for for our user base, right? And mm. so we want to give back as much as possible. And so if giving back means uh, creating a uh, you know a tournament in Nigeria that our players can play in, uh, you know, we'll bring scouts in there so that they can be seen. Uh, and if they're good enough, they'll they'll get picked or or get you know some chance to uh, to be seen you know maybe in another country what they're looking for, then we're all for it. You know, it's really about what drives the highest benefit for our user, uh, and and what helps them reach their goals. You know, it's about support. It's about positivity. I mean, you you guys know in the game, you guys are experts in in the mental side of the game and and just the game in general. And it's like you understand that there's a lot of negativity, you know, in the game. And as you pass through the process and the skates, right, that you're trying to achieve, like whether it's trying to be a high school player or you're trying to be a college player, or you're trying to make a certain club uh, team or you're trying to be a pro, there's a lot of gates you got to get past. And a lot of those are, are very negative processes, um, you know, and so we, so we feel like support, there's a big missing piece, which is support for these kids, uh, you know, and so the platform, that's our goal is to support these kids. And, you know, we tell people, if you don't need support, then come on the platform and support the kids, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you can come on there and you see a kid that looks good and you have a contact message, a kid and say, Hey, you know, you look really good. You know, we'd love to have you come over and, you know, come to an ID camp for this college or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, let's help, let's, let's be supportive and positive, uh, uh, in, in a world right now, you know, in the football world, it's just, it's tough, really mm. difficult, you know. I love that. I think Cal and I experienced that recently um, coming off an event that we did. You know, what came very apparent that you're talking about is like the positivity in the culture and the sense of belongingness in the players and the feeling of from these players that, you know, they can be themselves, you know. Um, so. What I'm trying to say is like your emphasis on positivity and culture, I, I just, I'm totally behind that. I think that's a massive deal that may, may get overlooked when um, people are looking at this whole thing of helping these young players. Right. Yeah. And, and it's also trainers too. I mean, anyone that's trying to reach their goals, maybe it's a small business, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a kid that, you know, is trying to start a, a club you know, to help kids that are, are disadvantaged or whatever it happens to be, whoever comes on the platform, you know, we're here to support them. And I think uh, that's a, it's a, um, it's a positive experience. And the only reason why I want to be involved is so that we can create something positive and make it, uh, you know, just less, you know, make it more efficient to be involved in the community as a whole too. You know what I mean? Like just it, right now it's so fragmented, everything that it just feels like it's really difficult. You know, you got to go to four or five different apps and, you know, to find out news and, you know, you got to go to team snap and all these different areas. And so it's like, we want to make it so that it's one login, it's more efficient. Uh, and it's also, um, like I said, just a, a more positive experience. So beautiful. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. On top of what coach Lucas said, I just think that it's, it's, it's truly a real problem that you're trying to solve. And and the fact that you're looking to create equal opportunity for everyone across the globe, it's so powerful. And, and, you know, this, this might seem like a little funny joke, but in all seriousness, I remember like when we, when I first stepped into this industry with coach Lucas, uh, over time, like I started to get these random Facebook messages from like a player in South Africa or Nigeria. And they would literally say, can you please bring me to America? And I, at, at the beginning, I was like, what the heck? And I look at their profiles and they're real kids. Like they're legitimate kids right. living a normal life, except a normal life in Nigeria. So the fact that you're looking to create these opportunities or more so equal opportunity across the globe, it's so big and it's so powerful. 
one of the things that coach Lucas mentioned is that like, you realize that this is bigger than you, right? This is bigger than right. all three of us. And that's where your network comes into play. These, these right. powerful leading experts within the industry that you have at your fingertips, Dave, can you speak to that a bit, your team, the people that you've brought together, and then even your network outside of that internal team? Yeah, I mean, we have a great team, you know, real quickly, just to finish up on that last point, you know, with these kids in, uh, in these countries, you know, in Africa, we, I've talked to a lot of these kids. And, and so the one reason we don't want to charge any money is because they get scammed. They get told, you know, hey, you know, we want you to go to this ID thing that's in this other city. You know, it's only $200 or whatever. And they scrape up their money and they put in $200 and then it's gone, you know. And I had never heard of that before, you know. And, and, and they were like, you're not asking for any money. And I was like, no, we don't want any of your money. You know, it's like we're, we're here to support you, you know. And so it's like that was a powerful thing that we learned is that there's a lot of scams going on and we didn't even realize that. So. So that's another reason why we want to make sure that our platform never, you know, asks for any money from any, any of these kids or any trainers or anyone. But on the on your next point, the, um, you know, we have some really amazing uh, people that are involved in this uh, this project. I mean, Mo Ali is on board. Uh, he's obviously one of the best influencers in the world. He's got millions of followers, and I think it's a million something on. Instagram, he's got seven or eight million on TikTok. I mean, he's got YouTube followers, he's working, you know, he's, it's amazing what that guy has, has done, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, in the business. And, uh, you know, we have Joe, Joe Ellsmore on board too, who was a 30 year Nike veteran, uh, you know, pretty much signed every U S player that you can name, uh, starting with, uh, um, you know, Mia Hamm even, you know, and so, um, we actually watched her play in college at North Carolina, you know, and so she was from Virginia, you know, uh, from our local area, but what a player, you know, but he signed a lot oh, yeah. of players. He signed Carly Lloyd. He's, you know, the guy knows, you know, everyone in the game, you know, and so we need this leverage, um, you know, so that we can grow this platform, but also uh, so that we can follow through on our, our um, promises to support people. You know, if we, if we, say we're going to support you but we have no contacts then it's it's tough you know and so we need to make sure that we have that network in place so that uh once we um really grow uh to scale that we can we can actually you know follow through on the promises of, of supporting these kids and so yeah the team is amazing uh feel lucky to have the people that we do and they're all footballers like we always say uh football life is built by footballers for footballers you know we're here we're not coming into this because we're some business guys that see an opportunity. We're here because we love the game. You know what I mean? We're here for, for passion, you know, not for, uh, you know, we're not here, uh, you know, because we got an MBA and we're right out of school and we're going to make a bunch of money. We're here to grow something that's going to be great. And and, and we can obviously uh, benefit from it too by using it. You know? I love that. I love that. This is totally sidebar, but when I was a kid, this thing there was a this campaign that came out called Yoga Bonito or Yoga Bonito. Do you remember that? Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, it was this like computer thing where like they would send you episodes of a new like Yoga Bonito episode every week. And I remember when that first came out. As a player, as a young player that was like 11 years old or whatever I was, like, that was so important for me. Like, it was so special. And, like, I looked forward to the next episode, like, every week. And, like, it inspired me to train more and just go juggle in the backyard and that type of thing. And when I hear you talk about football or life, David, I I can kind of feel a sense of that. Like, it, it, it's a place where footballers from anywhere can come in and get and be involved in the thing that they actually love doing, you know? And, um, I, anyway, totally sidebar, but yeah. Yeah. Inspiration, not inspire someone. Uh, and you got to engage them and reward them. You know, that's our goal is we want to inspire, uh, these kids to get involved, uh, you know, to, you know, a lot of them just kind of fall out fall out of the game or fall, you know, because they just don't have any access or, uh, you know, or, or they, you know, you know, you have kids that in Brazil that like, they want to, they're great players and they go down to Rio de Janeiro or wherever, and they have to uh, have a, an apartment paid for, 
uh, and then they just, you know, they don't have the access to that and they can't stay and they have to go home and they quit, you know, and it's like, we want to inspire these kids, you know, and, and, and for them to continue to push forward, you know, uh, and, and enjoy the game. And then, you know, it's a whole process, right? It's like, um, you know, football life, we're for the lifetime of the football enthusiasts, right? So like, we'll be there for you when you just start, you know, and then you go on and you go to college and maybe you decide, hey, I want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a soccer player in college, right? But that doesn't mean you don't still support Manchester United. And that mm-hmm. doesn't mean you don't still support your local club that you played at as a kid. And and then now that that doctor might have kids in the future that play, you know what I mean? And now we have the cycle starting over again. So it's like, we want to follow people through the whole cycle, you know, of of their love for the game. You know, it's, it's not just about playing. It's about, you know, going through life. I mean, I, I don't play anymore, but I watch more games than I ever did when I played, obviously. So but we're always watching games on TV. My wife is... I mean, when she met me in college, I, I think she knew a little bit about soccer, but then I, you know, I don't even know how excited she was to watch my college soccer game, to be honest with you, you know, and so <laughs> now she has kids, right? She's watched them play. And now we've gone to Europe and actually gone to see the games live. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I mean, she's a huge fan. I mean, she knows, you know, she's a hard working, you know, she's working hard all day long and she'll text us when Man City's starting lineup comes out i'm like she's got three people she's seeing in that office probably right now she still texts us the lineup to me and my son you know she's uh it's a lot of passion there you know for the game at least in our family so that's beautiful do you guys know what yoga bonito stands for it's uh beautiful uh beautiful beautiful game game or something like that the beautiful game yeah the beautiful game what's what I've always thought it was so crazy that soccer has been able to football soccer. They've been able to coin that term, the beautiful game, that terminology is dedicated to just one sport. And it's, it's known around the globe as well. Um, David, the viewers don't know this, obviously coach Lucas and I know this. I think it's one of the coolest aspects of football or life, but you guys see the football or life logo there behind David. And that logo actually means something near and dear to David's heart. And that boy in the blue right there is David's son. So David, can you tell us a little bit about that story, how that came to be and what the logo actually means? Yeah, so it's, it's a, I'm glad you asked that. It's a great uh, story and it's, it kind of like sums up the brand of Football of Life. Um, and so we were looking for something that represented passion, right? You know, cause that's what Football of Life is, is about one passion that everyone shares. And so we were just like thinking, man, what's a good representation of passion, right? And uh, and so we were like, it's the celebration, right? I mean, it's when people celebrate a goal, that is the part of the game, right? Is what, when people celebrate. They celebrate however they want to do it. You know what I mean? That they're they're expressing themselves, you know? And so, so anyway, we uh, found a picture of my son that we thought was perfect. And so the, the story behind this picture is great because... Uh, uh, he was just, uh, I think, first game in a club system, right? So he was like in the little grassroots, you know, games or whatever for a year or two. <laughs> and then he got into this uh, club uh, in called Sereno in Arizona. And so uh, he was, uh, um, I don't even know if he's on the first team, might have even been on the second team. But anyway, uh, we were at the game and my wife always taking pictures and she's got the camera on her lap and we weren't expecting to score. And he just, put in some junk goal. I don't even think he just like shot it and bounced around and went in and, and he just started flying around, you know, like this, you know, like, <laughs> you know, cause he scored. And I looked at my wife and I was like, did you get that shot? You know, and she never even took a camera. She just was like, Oh my God, I was so excited. I was like screaming, you know, and I was just like, Oh, I was like, I was so mad. I was like, you missed that. That was amazing. What he just did. You know, I couldn't believe it. Just the kid out of the blue just scored and went crazy like that. And you don't know what you're going to do when you score, right? Because like, you know what I mean? Like when sometimes it's such a big moment, you do something stupid, you take off your shirt or whatever. <laughs> and so, so anyway, I, uh, we had another game the next day and I was like, I told my wife, I said, look, it, we might get, have to get divorced if we don't get the next one. <laughs> and she was like, all right, so she, I'll keep the camera close. And so, so anyway, th- he had a free kick the next game and he did, he scored and he did the same thing again. You know, he just started running around with airplane, you know, and she got that. She snapped that picture. 
And so that's the silhouette of him celebrating uh, his second goal ever um, as a, uh, you know, as a club player. So it's a great moment. I think it really I'm, sums up the, the brand. So. I'm so I'm so mad that Cal brought up the logo thing first because like this whole time I've been like waiting for my moment to <laughs> to bring up the logo <laughs> thing because like I love that logo I love that logo and I told you this before a, a week ago or so David like yeah. I really love that logo because when you see it you can Im immediately if you're a footballer you immediately resonate with what that means you know and right. um, I'm. I'm astonished that that wasn't done by some freelancer design artist. Like I'm astonished that that's an actual photo of your son. So I, I it's on our website, I, Lucas, you got to go see it. It's on our website. On the, about <laughs> page, the actual picture. It's pretty cool. You know, it's like that, that's kind of a good segue into the, um, the lifestyle brand. You know, it's like, we're going to, we're developing a lifestyle brand for footballers and we don't feel like there's anything out there. Obviously you can wear Nike or whatever, but you know, it's not, it's, they have all different sports, you know, and it's like, we want to create something that's authentic that ties into our community. Right. So it's an extension of the community, just like our YouTube channel is an extension of the community. Right. It's like, you know, I want uh Cal walking around with a, a football like hoodie and someone to go be like, dude, you're on, you're on that app. Like, that's so cool. I'll connect with you. You know what I mean? What's your username? right we want to create like a yep. community where it's super tight you know and people are like you know when they see that hoodie or those pants or or the hat or whatever that we have you know that we're, we're uh, going to launch in the future uh it's an instant connection right um with that person because you know that they they share the passion of football right whether they're in spain or in chicago or or in london right yeah, I mean, I got to admit, even you just telling that story and describing the fact that it's supposed to illustrate passion, like, I get goosebumps just hearing about it, because I remember those moments when I was a kid, too. And a lot of the times I was the one who did something stupid, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> no, <you're laughs> further right. than that, I just think it's a beautiful story. I'm actually going to go ahead and show the audience um, the original photo before we close out this this podcast episode, David. Really quick before I do, why don't you tell them? about your son today. And uh, one of the things that's happened recently as well, I think they'd love to hear how that goes for full circle. Yeah, so he uh, he just signed a uh, two-year contract with the uh, Northern Colorado Hailstorm in the USL, which is great, exciting for him. And so that's he's uh, taking that next step. Uh, you know, he's a youngster, so he's skipping college, which of course is a big decision, you know, these days. and. So, uh, you know, we thought about it and, you know, he's a pretty talented kid and talked to some people and they said, hey, you know, he's probably worth giving it a shot. Uh, if it doesn't work out, it's okay. Just give what you, you know, everything you got and see, uh, you know, where it leads. But he's now a pro signing shirts and all these funny things, you know, signing autographs. It's, just, it's a funny thing how that, uh, that works out. But, uh, but all that work, uh, I think, paid off and that's what we want to uh, to help you know the next generation is help them get you know meet those goals whatever they are that's amazing that's amazing and i can't imagine how proud of you your son may be to the the fact that you know you're building an entire community that is actually going to be supportive of him and himself right but uh for everyone watching this is the original photo here of david's son which you can see is a a perfect representation of the logo i mean the happiness on this kid's face is is the happiness that we're we, we really the happiness that we want to emulate with the Footballer Life platform and the Footballer Life pod. So, uh, David, honestly, it couldn't have been more of a pleasure to just get to know you today and your entire story, more so the story of Footballer Life. And uh, it's going to be an even greater pleasure to watch the rest of this story unfold. So, thanks again for your time today. I couldn't be more happy to be a part of this and alongside you and i'm excited for the next episode when we celebrate a million users on the footballer life platform you cut out there david said I, I, said, I, I said we really appreciate what you guys are doing you know as hosts like it's critical and you guys you know for us for us as a team it's amazing to have you guys uh working with us on this project and this youtube channel and podcast and all that so 
uh, like I said, we really uh, we really love what you guys are doing, and we're excited to bring on some great guests and tell some great stories uh, and educate uh, you know people on the channel in the future. So. Beautiful. For everyone watching, comment below who you'd like to see as a guest, a leading expert in the industry, and I'm sure we can nab them utilizing David Clark here's network. Uh, but outside of that, questions, comments, concerns, just drop them below, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. See you, guys.